Hey everyone, it's Oscar Beckler at Lake Washington. We have a snow day, so I'm sort of transitioning to an at-home lesson, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about Photoshop Tennis. So Photoshop Tennis is the game we've been playing, and this is an example of one of the images from week one. It was posted. Now my goal for week two is to take this, modify it in some way, and then post it to the week two thread over and over and over, and uh, so on and so forth. Now, what's great about Photoshop t Tennis is there's no right or wrong answers. You know, you can do all sorts of things. Uh, but it's really good if you have some sort of concept that you're going for. So uh, my thought right now is uh, I like this penguin. And I thought I would do something kind of gruesome, kind of like a Monty Python thing, where I was going to take this penguin. And what if it had a katana in its mouth? And you could imagine it swooping across here. And in a very, you know, again, it's, it's like cartoon violence. A Monty Python way, the penguin is slashed in half by its enemy, and we have like this fake round of meat inside of it. And so, how would we go about doing that? Well, first off, I found these images on Flickr under Creative Commons licenses. Uh, you know, searching for images is part of the task. <clears throat> and now I'm going to organize it. So, the first thing that I wanted to show here was um, how to separate your objects from the background. And speaking of which, I think we're going to have a 1.5 here, which is going to be um, content-aware stuff, Fill, which would be the fill tool, the clone stamp, maybe the healing brush. By the way, on a text layer, while you're inside of the text, you can hold control and it temporarily switches to the move tool up here. Therefore, I can move it out of the way. And also, you can hit control enter to apply it as opposed to hitting enter, which normally, or I think return, which instead returns down. So if you're all done, you hit control R. And you use control T for a free transform and just shrink that down so it doesn't get in our way. So our first task is to take this penguin and separate it from the background. And that's something where just having a layer stack order of layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four, layer five, um, in a sensible Z depth uh, is really good. Z depth being like, whatever, it's a 3D thing. So I'm gonna take this penguin and there's a couple of ways we could do it. You could just select it like this with the lasso tool. We could also use the magnetic lasso tool. Maybe that'll work. And as you go with the ma magnetic lasso tool, if it goes crazy, just hit backspace and it'll go back in time on your magnetic lasso tool. Again, you can get this with shift L, which will toggle through the various lasso tools. So that went a little crazy. That's a little better. And any sort of like hard angle here, that's a good time to like manually force a point. Again, if you're on Photoshop 2020, I recommend the object select tool. But for old time's sake, here we are. And again, don't worry about getting everything right in one selection. You don't like put the cup of flour in your pancake batter and when it doesn't taste like pancakes right away, declare defeat. You build your selections out of multiple things. So here I can see some problems down here on the foot. So maybe I could go in with the polygonal lasso now. Shift L to toggle through that. And I could, for instance, cut out this tiny little bit. Oops, I accidentally held the wrong key. Again, in Photoshop, when you're starting off, you're gonna all the time hit Alt and Shift and Control, and it's going to change the nature of your tools. So right now I'm on the polygonal lasso. If there's already a selection while hovering over the it'll let me move the selection. And if I hold Alt, it switches to the Subtract tool. Many, many tools do that in Photoshop. I can just select, subtract out that area that I don't want. I could actually add that back in as a, a blending of those two feet areas. I think that's like the shadow under the penguin. And this is the actual penguin. Same thing here. 
So I'm just using Alt to turn it on select. You could, of course, be a noob and go up here and turn off or turn on permanent subtracts from selection. And now it's always going to be on that. Don't do that. Learn your hotkeys and use them all the time. So Alt, click, 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 get rid of them. looking pretty good maybe some of this area could be smoothed out doesn't have to be perfect you know it's just Photoshop tennis but this looks pretty good I think yeah yeah again don't worry about the JPEG artifact it's kind of the fun of Photoshop tennis right you embrace the you embrace that weird JPEG artifact Okay, so that's looking pretty good, which gets us to our next step, which is how do we separate this selection into two things? So we could have like the scene as it is and the penguin as a separate layer. We're going to start by duplicating this whole layer down and applying this as a mask. Now, chances are it's going to be incorrect. Oh, no, it's correct. And so now this penguin is on its own separate thing. And I can move it around. We could have multiple penguins. In fact, with the move tool, you could hold Alt and clone this out. That's a much happier scene than the you know gruesome sword violence that I was mentioning earlier. So we got this penguin and we're moving him out of the way. Or rather for now I'm just going to close that. And now I'm going to modify this layer. Now there's a couple ways you can do this. One is to duplicate it and just work on a fresh layer. And because I duplicated it, I know I have this one down here that's safe. But uh, the more accepted way of doing this now is using smart objects. Now what smart objects do is they temporarily store your Photoshop information for a layer in like a separate nodal file. Now, you know, obviously Photoshop is behind the times. They don't have an actual node based interface, but they create these like hor horrible little like fake nodes here. So this is an example of a smart object. These were JPEGs that I just dropped in and one of them was instead downloaded. You can see it over here in my downloads folder. And I dragged it into the Photoshop layer, which means that it created a hot link between that layer in Photoshop and this thing over here, this file. So if I modify this file, it'll update to do that in Photoshop. In fact, let's open this in Photoshop and see that. So what if I took this whole area that we don't need, this katana blade? Well, I might need the katana blade. Let's just fill this with black or white. Let's save it and close it. And now when I double click this, oh, never mind. Well, if I double click this one and do that, now I'm auto, um, modifying the official one that's in this Photoshop document. So it created a separate node rather than use the one that had been dragged in. So if I save this and close it, you'll notice that it updates over here. Now, why would you use smart objects? Well, when I double click to enter into the smart object, I'm modifying the exact layer, but when I'm modifying it in this document it's applying meta um, edit, meta edits to this rather than that official one whereas this you know, so like to show this as an example I could hit control T and damage this file incredibly and I could do the same thing to this stake here and one of them is a smart object and therefore the damage will not really exist so I could for instance uh, double click this, it's still scaled proportionately, right? Whereas this stake is permanently damaged. So if I scale it back, there's going to be pixel problems from that scaling in and scaling out. So I want to make this uh, penguin into a smart object and also this background layer. So I'm going to right click on this and choose. I think I actually do want to. You never know which tools are allowed in smart objects. But if you right click on the name, not on the thumbnail, when you right click on the thumbnail, you get the thumbnail options. If you right click on the name of this, you get convert to smart object as one of the options. I believe it's also over here in the layers pull down. Again, your Photoshop might look slightly different from mine. But you want convert to smart object. And now I gotta actually see if this tool works. I think I can use the clone stamp tool the healing brush 
or the content aware fill tool. Let's do content aware fill first. And it'll just apply that as a fake nodal meta edit on top of this while not actually affecting the actual thing. So I'm just doing a rough selection of this penguin. Or if you wanted to be more meticulous, you might actually control click on that previous mask that you made. Uh, expand the mask with select, modify, expand. It's nice to have just a couple of buffer pixels here. And let's see if this works. Shift F5. I didn't test this beforehand. Edit. Fill. Nope, it doesn't work. So, never mind. We don't want this to be a smart object. The easiest way to kill smart objects is to create a new layer on top of it, merge it down with Control E. So, where was I? Select this penguin. Select. Modify. Expand. And now I'm going to use Edit fill. You could also just jump right to content aware fill, but I like using the fill dialog where it says content aware fill. And this is going to try and replace the innards of our selection with whatever is in the neighboring pixels. So if I turn this off, you'll see that it did a pretty good job. Just to do that again with this layer turned off. So on this layer, I'm going to shift F5, content aware fill. Boop. That looks fine to me. Now, of course, there's a couple other ways that you could do this. You could, there's always more ways to do it. You could, of course, do this more by hand using something like the healing brush, which is something where like you um, just draw this and it'll sample neighboring pixels and erase it. But it gets a little wonky. Way back in the day, we had a couple of other tools, like Patch Tool. Patch Tool is really good if you have like a large area that you know is correct. And you start by dragging around the area that you want to patch copy. So I know this horizon is good, and I left click to do that. Now I can drag it over and I'll do the opposite. I select what I don't want. But this, instead of like using content to wear fill stuff, It'll, it'll maintain the veracity of the pixels a little more. But clearly, content aware fill is uh, the winner. Select, modify, expand. I expand it, and then shift F5. Also, control backspace, no. Alt backspace, no. Shift backspace, that's what you do in Photoshop and other 3D programs. It's one of these hotkeys, so just do all five of them and then undo until you find the right one. So, content of our fill, share color adaptation, boop, penguin's gone. So now we have this one that is separate. Uh, now I'm going to sort of separate this into two separate penguin halves that are getting, you know, sliced in half in a gruesome sort of kill bill way. So I'm going to start by duplicating this layer. Uh, I can duplicate by right clicking and choosing duplicate layer. You can also choose layer, duplicate layer. I think Control J might duplicate a layer. Yes, Control J duplicates a layer. Always use the hotkey, right? Hotkeys are pro. Control J duplicates layer. So now I have to get rid of some sort of top half of this penguin. And so I'm going to do something where I think I'm going to do this by applying a second mask to this. And let's see. You know I'm going to use the elliptical marquee instead. That'll be nice. But Oscar, you don't have the top half of the penguin. Oh no, what a failure. Well, guess what? You can build selections out of multiple selections. And that's the way you want to do it. And that's the best way. So that's pretty good. I'm trying to get these ellipticals right here and over here. Because although this has nothing to do with Photoshop, it's important to know that ellipses do not have points. They are not footballs. Something like that. You can also, if you didn't get it right on the first time, in the same way that you use uh, edit transform for free transform, you can actually transform just the selection. So I can choose transform selection. And this isn't actually going to modify the image. It's just going to let me reposition this, which is a lot better than 
having to like manually choose this little thing. That is pretty good. Now I need the upper half of the penguin as well. So I will switch to the polygonal lasso. Again, shift L to switch through the various lasso tools. And click, click, click. Pow, pow, pow. Yeah, something like that. That looks good. I think I can on this mask, take that and invert it. And now we have a mask of a mask. Can't do a second layer. Oh, it added a vector mask. That's dumb. No wonder. Add mask to selection. Nope. So on this one, I'm just going to delete that from its mask. And now I'm going to select this one. And I will invert the selection. Control Shift I. And delete it. So now I have two penguin halves. Put them up there. Uh, that's looking pretty good. Now we need our steak. Ugh, this is so gross. This is oxtail, which is key ingredient in soup. I feel like I'm going to get in trouble for this video. Hopefully not. I'm sorry if meat makes you squeamish. So I'm going to position this. Actually here. Well, that's an example of where we need to use a smart object. So if I right click <coughs> and convert to a smart object, I can start transforming this down to no pixels. Like basically one pixel big. Now normally if you did that, that would be very bad. Actually, in fact, let's um Let's do that just to show how bad it is. So here's this one. I'm going to scale it down to really small. Now I'm going to scale it back up. It didn't have any pixels to work with, and so we've been destructive on this image. And so that's sort of the goal of the smart object workflow is you want to be non-destructive. So by right-clicking and converting to a smart object, we're not actually working on this image anymore. We're working on a proxy of it that sends that data of transformation down to a little node. Now you can't see the node tree. This Photoshop is pathetic. But we could scale it down to something like that. And we can even do stuff like uh, distort. Uh, perspective might fool you into thinking it's the best perspective tool, but I actually think the best one is just distort all the time because this gives you manual control of every single point here. get some sort of start to having this fit. I can also start to get rid of some of this stuff with a mask. So I'm going to use Shift L and I click on here. I hope you guys enjoyed your snow day. I hope you uh, don't feel too pressured by its impediment to your education. Again, please pepper me with questions if you're, uh, if you ever hit a road bump in Photoshop. I try to respond ASAP on Canvas messages in particular. So this sometimes happens, which is like down there on the bottom. Uh, the magnetic lasso didn't get it perfect. And you know what? Just like go in and paint it by hand. I'm using a mouse to do this. And I'm just switching back and forth between X, or between black and white using X. I'm not really switching between black and white. I'm switching between my foreground and background color. But they're set to black and white, which you can always reset with D. So D to reset to black and white, even if you're on. Um, 
Crazy colors. You can hit D to reset them. And toggle them back and forth with X. That's pretty good. Meet silhouette. And let's apply it as a mask. And now I can move this below here. And hopefully have something that's starting to work is like, whoa, what happened to this poor penguin? At this point, I'm gonna use the warp tool. Oh, never mind. It's not gonna let me. Oh, I think I'm gonna move it below. Yeah, that looks good. Sure, what's going on here? You know, when in doubt, duplicate a layer, and then just destroy it. So again, you can create a new layer with Control Shift N, and then immediately merge down with Control E. And now this is a destroyed layer. Sometimes it's good to be destroyed. So now I could warp it. So I hit Control T for transform. It's the same as going Edit, Transform. Then I right click and choose Warp. And what this one will do is let me sort of use Bezier's to like get this just right. Oh, this poor penguin. Now if you got really fancy, you could do something like uh, the skin layer around here. Whatever, it's supposed to be lighthearted. Don't get, don't get too obsessed with perfect selections and whatnot. So now I need my katana blade, probably a mall sword, and that's one where I might just. Look at my channels. Channel selections are really fun because they're oftentimes just so instantaneous. But, you know, I don't know. I don't think there's anything that's high contrast enough in this one or isolated in color. So, how about we use the quick select tool? Again, this one, we'll assume we brush along here. Oh no, some of it got incorrect. I guess we have to throw the whole selection away. No, don't think that way. When that happens, all you do is just edit a little bit. So that is probably more than I needed. So this got me pretty far. And now I'll just fix the last few things with the polygonal lasso tool. So Shift L toggles between the various lassos until I'm there. right there sometimes you can be stuff like that I prefer to actually get it with some of this painting stuff Oops. you can just go back and forth it's another one of those cases where don't freak out if you get it wrong on the first swipe you can always get it right on the next one and also, especially for like edges like this, that's a great place to use shift click with the brush tool. So I'm in uh, quick mask mode, which I toggled with Q. It gives me a brush based, uh, you know, pixel based way to interact with the selection. I'm using the brush tool, using the hard round brush, which I think you can find in the general brushes. All my settings are at 100%, 100% opacity, 100% flow. And now I'm holding shift while clicking from spot to spot and just clean up some of this stuff. And when I go off kilter like that, I just switch to the other color with X and I erase.
Now it's kind of questionable um, whether you want this mask to have any of that. Like, if I see this black pixel here in the background, do I want that or do I have to destroy it at all costs? Uh, there's some amount of fixing we can do in post and that'll determine it for us. So something like this. Yeah, just get rid of that. There's another one where it went slightly off base. That's a pretty good selection. So the thing I was talking about, how can we get a secondary effect on this? Well, first off, I'm going to mask it, clicking the mask button here. Now this sword is ready to do damage. Well, one thing you can do is click on this object properties panel here. And this has stuff that's about this specific layer or object. So if it's a layer group, that's one thing you can do. And one of the things you can do is um, adjust the feather and the density of it. So sometimes you can feather it a little. And I think if you got to select the mask, there's a way to like choke on it. But I don't remember how. So screw it. I could always manually choke on it by clicking on the mask. Uh, select. Actually, another way we could do this is if I alt click on this, this will let me view just the mask. You'll notice it has this fringe. I could use levels to choke that out. That sounds bad. Um, but you could also modify this with um, by control clicking on this so that it's my selection and then you select modify just uh, contract a little bit and now on this I'm going to invert my selection and remove that little bit of fringe with the leap key so it removed a little bit more of the fringe but I have just the katana. Now that I have just this katana, I can control T, right click, and retransform it. And I need this to be opposite sided. Flip horizontal. for staging purposes. I really want it down here. So how would I go about that? Well, I could go back to this and I could separate that penguin onto a different layer, or at least its head, so that the head is tilted more. Let's do that. So I'm going to start by just getting a selection. I'll switch to the magnetic lasso tool. Actually, this is one where it goes in and out between the black and white of this penguin versus the black and white of this penguin. But I think I'm going to be kind of worrying about this and just do it manually. Because like right here where his head is against that, that's one of those things where my instinct is that I'm not going to pull a good selection with any of the cheap trick ones. duplicate this layer and you know sometimes when I'm doing this what I hate is now if I mask this and I transform it it transforms the whole layer so that's a case where I actually might be destructive I might go in here and select all this other stuff that I don't need and actually delete it from the layer so when I transform it I have something of a sensible 
place for this. I'm just gonna move him like that. So he's a little more pointing down. Now on this guy, I'm gonna go back over here. And let's duplicate it. Never hurts to duplicate all the time, every day, just to make sure that you're gonna be safe. Oops. I accidentally had the B key moving. So this would be something where maybe now I go in. I could try content aware fill, shift F5. Yeah, it works okay. I could try the patch tool, which will let me take this and move it down. And that worked pretty good. I'll call it there. And then I think maybe for the last thing is I can just use the spot healing brush. I can never remember if you select the bad area and go to the good area. You select the good area and go to the bad area. There's probably a toggle for it, too. And of course, you could do what I love, which is brute face painting, brute force painting. Yeah. What's wrong with just color picking off of what you know is the successful color there? And painting it away. So what I do a lot is I set my flow to 10%. And then I just color, I'll just, to show it one more time. I know I need this bright yellow to clone, or to blend down there. So I'll color pick it. I'll paint a little bit of that down. And at some point with, especially if I just do one click, I have some color that's in between them. So then I just color pick off that and I color pick, color pick, color pick. So it's kind of blended. Same thing down here. So let's see. That's where the head is. And again, don't get too impressed with Photoshop. People were drawing mind-bendingly realistic portraits a hundred years ago and then it's shocking how often like the existence of a fancy tool means like we're scared to use it or like you know the idea that you can content aware fill means that um actually gonna select this I think I just need a little more of this on the mask. And that mask, I'm gonna paint yes over here. I'm gonna ship my flow back to 100% with shift zero. Again, shift one through shift zero modifies the flow using the keyboard and your opacity can be modified with one through zero. So now, where's my Cantana? There we are. And I don't feel like going over this whole thing, so let's just cheat. There's my penguin mask. I know I need some of it there, so let's just paint away from the mask based on that selection. First off, I loaded the selection by holding control and clicking on that mask. I can now go to my Katana, and I know that black means you don't see it. So I can just paint with 100% flow where his beak would be and where his beak would not be. You can even create a layer underneath here. Put a little bit of shadow on here. Set this to multiply. Multiply is a layer mode trans uh, or a blend mode. I set it to multiply, which means that anything I draw here is going to darken it. So I'll just color pick that. And I want 
want the shadow to be on the thing. Setting my brush to 10% flow, maybe even 40% opacity. Add a little bit of shadow. Now I'm going to control click that beak again. And on my shadow layer, erase. Of course, now we're getting into material rendering properties. So I messed up. I can't get this right, right? What if I go back up here? Here's my history, and I can click through these things. Now over here, it kind of looked right. Over here, I went too far. In fact, let's go even further. Oh no, I erased too much. I can use the history brush to go back in time. Like Huey Lewis. First, what you have to do is click on this little history icon, and then you switch to the history brush, which I think is Y. Why is it Y? History. And what this does is it will paint in this bookmarked point in time. So now I could paint it back. A lot of times what I do is I use control H to see how it's going. And that looks pretty good. <coughs> so what else is there? Oh yeah, color match is kind of useful. Uh, color match is something we could use on the katana and the meat to make it a little closer to the sort of high key polar lighting, yeah, Antarctic lighting that we have here. So here's my meat, right? We could use image, adjustments, match color. I'm going to choose untitled one. And which layer do I want? It looks like it's layer two. What a horrible name for a layer. Let's see what happens. That didn't do anything. There we go. Ignore selection. Layer. Image. Adjustment. Match color. Source. Untitled 1. Layer. Layer 2. And. I don't know. I guess they're both pretty similar. Uh, that's what I want. Anyways, theoretically, it's supposed to take the input image and duplicate it for the other one. That works pretty good. I don't know, what else could we do to up this? Well, obviously turn the text off. Maybe we could add some sort of uh, blood streak or katana thing. I don't know how much energy I have for that. But I could duplicate my katana layer. I'm going to merge it. <coughs> and now I have this katana layer on top of a katana. Let's use filter, motion blur. Get it traveling in the direction that we want. Oh, are we totally on the wrong layer?
Push him there. There it is. So it's kind of going the right way. I go like that, right? Maybe we can use radio There, where? Solution blur. That's what I wanted. I think it was calculating wrong because I had something like way off in the distance. So I'm gonna now make it so that it's ignoring one side of that. And it's also gonna be on the bottom layer below this. So I want this below my sword. And now I'm gonna duplicate it a bunch with Control J so it shows up more. Maybe not that much. So by blurring it, there wasn't a lot of pixels to work with. By duplicating it, there's a little more. I can merge them down. And now also erase away from it. Or even better, apply a mask and paint away on a non-destructive mask layer. So I switch to the brush tool, switch to black. Let's choose a soft round brush. Let's paint away that motion blur over here. I don't know. You could add some blood. I don't know. It's kind of a silly idea at this point. But that's what Photoshop tennis is. Ridiculous ideas. So I hope this was helpful. I hope you saw some new tools that might add into your workflow. And in classic Photoshop tennis, I'm now going to save this as a JPEG. With low quality. Okay, bye.